Welcome everyone. I am Hillary Barker, the session host for Heather Walter and Gabby Hernandez and their presentation, Texas Two-Step, Varied Approaches to Supporting Faculty Adoption and Creation of OER. The Wisconsin Open Education Symposium is committed to being a safe, accessible, equitable, and inclusive environment for all. Our code of conduct is in effect during the session and in all conference spaces. Please take a moment to reflect on how your actions can build up our open education community and support diverse voices. This session is being recorded and will be captioned for future viewing. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Um, as we said, I'm Heather Walter. I'm the Talker Open Education Librarian at UT Austin, and I am joined today by Gabby Hernandez. Well, Gabby, you might be on mute. Hi, everybody. Hi, Gabby, Gabby Hernandez, <laughs> the Open Education Librarian at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. And I'm really happy to be here with y'all today. So today we're going to be talking about uh, our approaches to supporting faculty and adoption and creation of OER and the different programs that we use at our institutions. So a little bit about us before we begin. I, mean, I think this is your slide, go ahead. Yes. Um, so again, like I said, Gabby Hernandez, the Open Education Librarian at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Um, I have been in this position now for a couple of years and I support all things with our textbook affordability project um, at UTRGV. So I just support faculty, students and advocate with administrators to ensure uh, we have textbook affordability um, initiatives throughout our university. And I'm Heather Walter. I'm the Open Education Librarian at UT Austin. It's a relatively new position, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. I'm the second Open Education Librarian to have it. Uh, so it really only started in 2019. Um, but I actually have two degrees from UT Austin, so I am very well versed in the culture and the climate and extremely happy to be here today. And my email contact is there if you need to reach out to me after the presentation. So a little bit about OER institutions. This is kind of a history of OER, what we've done so far and what led us to building the programs that we have today. And I'll let Gabby start with UTRBG. Yes, so our program really started with the Affordable Textbook Adoption Grant um, in fall 2019. So that was our first uh, try with trying to engage faculty with OER. And because we had started this a little bit, then they were able to advocate for a part time open education or a part time OER librarian, which was myself. Um, so I was also the first person in this role at my institution. And then uh, uh, after a year part time, then I was able to come on full time as the open education librarian. And during that time, we joined both Spark and OEN to help support our program um, and to help learn uh, both ourselves and for our fact to support our faculty. We were also a part of the OpenStax Institutional Partnership from 2020 through 2022. Um, we had such great success in the 2020-2021 cohort that we were asked to um, repeat the process again so we could continue that growth and progress at our institution. And through all of those things, we were able to learn and we support lots of different programs uh, within the textbook affordability project, which includes many professional development uh, stipends for our faculty, faculty recognition through our affordability advocates program. We offer just in general professional development uh, sessions. We also have e-textbook discovery, which is um, purchasing unlimited user licensed ebooks for assigned textbooks for courses. Um, and then we have a budding library publishing project as well as overseeing course marking, um, among other things that we do for faculty. So, not too much then. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> just, just a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, at UT Austin, we have uh, many of the same things. Um, my, as I mentioned before, my position, the Talker Open Education Librarian position was created in 2019. And this was through endowment funds from the Talker Foundation who wanted to support the efforts of OER at UT. And so there was one librarian before me, I am the second one to come in. Uh, what we've done so far at UT has been a focus on really trying to capture the picture of OER and figure out what is happening on campus. And so one of the things that we've done so far 
It's a course syllabus review to identify areas and faculty who are already using OER. Uh, so we put a lot of effort into that to try to capture that bigger picture of how much OER is being used on campus. It's very tricky as not all faculty report OER, uh, finding it requires some detective work, but it has helped us understand a little bit about uh, what that climate kind of looks like. We also have several partnerships going on at our campus, including the OER Working Group, and that is a group of faculty faculty, uh, students, and uh, librarians who come together to work on projects in OER initiative. We partner with faculty informally to address their OER needs and to help specifically target how they might use OER in their learning environments. Um, and then um, we have the OE Fellowship, which was what I'm going to be talking about today, which was established in 2021. And that's going to be, that's a library stipend supported program in which faculty are given monetary awards in order to create or adopt OER. And that's like the whole thing that I'm talking about. So I'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, we also have the Affordable Education Champions Program. And that is a way for students to recognize faculty who are doing a particularly outstanding job in offering free or low cost course materials. And it's just a way to recognize faculty. They really, I think students really appreciate being able to do that. And then we also have um, lots of professional development, uh, sorry, opportunities like Gabby mentioned, uh, and we do course reviews individually with faculty who reach out to us to try to help them see where they might use OER in their learning environments. So a little bit within this next part is a little bit of our institutional data. It's not too much data. We know data is boring, so we're not going to shove a lot of data in your face. But we did want to kind of highlight why we started these programs and what what's the why behind our OER? Like, why is OER important at our institutions? So this first slide is about UT Austin, and this uh, course survey was taken uh, from about 4,000 students who reported their difficulties and struggling with uh, paid course materials in their uh, academic careers. And so 35% of that sample, student sample survey reported often frequently are always being prevented from access, accessing course materials uh, due to cost. And as you can see from the table, uh, some of them took fewer courses or didn't register for a course simply because they knew they couldn't afford it. Um, some of them just like didn't purchase the required materials. So we're not sure how they got it, if they utilized libraries or if they just kind of like did what they could. But this really highlights that at UT Austin, like there are students who struggle and we want them, especially the, the students who are either dropping a course or they're not taking a course, that could have been a very formative course for them. It could have been something that really broadened um, their academic career or their interests or showed the path that they didn't really realize that they had before. And so we want our students taking every learning opportunity possible. And if they're skipping out on those because of the cost of course materials, then that's definitely something that we want to help them with. And a little bit about UTRGV, uh, we are a super unique institution. So if you have never heard the name, we're fairly new. Um, two separate UT institutions banded together to become UTRGV. So we have two separate campuses under one UTRGV label. Um, and so at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, we are located at the very, very, very tip of Texas on the US-Mexico border. And so um, we, our enrollment is kind of in that 30,000 student range. We're a commuter campus. Uh, we support all of our services on both of our campuses, which are about an hour apart. Um, both of our major campuses and um, we are one of the largest Hispanic serving institutions in the United States because of where we are, uh, you know, uh, locational on our map. And so UTRGV is number one mission and goal is to make sure that we provide accessible um, higher education for our students. So there's many, many things that are happening to make sure just higher education in general is affordable. But even with that, um, you know, text, we all know textbooks are a huge cost barrier to that role. So maybe they're getting their tuition paid for. They have free tuition, free fees, but then they have to purchase textbooks. And if they couldn't afford tuition, they probably also cannot afford their textbooks. So this is more informal data that I've collected just with talking uh, to our students during Open Education Week. And so what they have said, our students have said, is that they spend about an average of $300 a, sem a semester on textbooks. 
And when I asked what would they do with that money instead, the majority of our students say that they would save it. They just wouldn't have spent it in the first place, which matches that they didn't have it to begin with. And so they wouldn't have spent it. But then other things they talk about is food and clothes, technology, lots of lots of car issues. So like they talk about, I would pay for gas. I would pay for uh, my insurance payments because we're a commuter campus. That's really at the forefront of their mind. Um, and the smallest sliver is other, but to me, those are always the most impactful stories. And so one of our students said they, um, they spent about $300, his, theirs was a little bit more expensive. It was more like four to $600 on textbooks. And they said with that money, they would have purchased their citizenship applications. So when we're talking about those kinds of this kind of impact, you know, we're not talking about you know, lazy students. We're not talking about students who don't care about their education, but students who are facing really huge life decisions and that semester of trying to purchase a, tech, a textbook could really impact their lives in a, in a really major way. So with our textbook affordability project, so the funds that we have received um, we have saved about a million dollars between course redesigns and um, library licensed outreach, so uh, purchasing those library licensed materials, and that's impacted over 12,000 student seats, and we have engaged over 800 faculty in our program, and that could be anything from faculty who've applied to grants or attended a professional development session or who have marked their course as a zero or a low cost course. And I find it so interesting, Gabby, the average textbook costs uh, per semester. You said per semester was 300. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I did not include this slide in our presentation, but based off our data, students spend about seven, 700, a little over 700 per year on textbooks. So it's really interesting to me that despite our campuses being, you know, so far apart in such different demographics, like that number really does align. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Um, and like, like Gabby said, Gabby, of course, has a very unique demographic at her school, very unique students. Uh, UT Austin, uh, while we do have uh, you know, very different students than what Gabby serves, I do think it's also important to kind of recognize that if you're not familiar with the way Texas University works, we have a top 5% rule, uh, which allows top 5% from any high school within the state to uh, be automatically accepted into a state school like UT Austin. And that's actually how I got into UT Austin like a million years ago in grad school. It was the top 10% then. Uh, but even as a student who was coming from a privileged background, a student who, I'm speaking for myself, student coming from a privileged background where my needs were met, where I didn't have to worry about a lot, it was very difficult moving from the high school environment into the university environment. Um, and so a lot of these students who are coming from more rural areas, or maybe they have different life circumstances, but they still work very hard and they get into the top 5%. It can be very difficult coming to a school like UT Austin, where we have such a varying demographics and backgrounds and financial statuses. Um, so like Gabby, um, a percentage of our students really do need OER courses because as Gabby mentioned, they're making big life decisions and it's very difficult to be where they are sometimes. Um, as uh, Gabby was called talking about cost savings, these are UT cost savings that we have done through uh, internal course review surveys that I mentioned before. And so we only have four years of data of this so far because we've only been collecting it for that long. And I would say that a lot of this data is an undercount. So starting in the academic year 2019-2020, uh, we were only say we're saving students less than $500,000 for OER, and that was just kind of like what was reported. But the last two uh, academic years, we've been saving over a million and a half, and that's just based off cost savings estimated from if students were to have to pay for a textbook in courses that offer OER instead. And if you're interested in more about this data collection, I'm happy to go into that either in the question section or if you reach out to me um, after the presentation. But let's talk about our programs, our faculty programs and what we're doing and how we're supporting them. So we're gonna talk a little bit about our OER support programs. And these are how we directly, the library directly assists faculty who are trying to incorporate or create OER for their courses. Gabby takes a more tiered approach, kind of a, like an intro into how you might do that. So Gabby's gonna to talk to you a little bit first about our VG, or sorry, UTRDB and what they do. 
And then I'm going to come in with a program that might be more for faculty creations and monetary support with that. So at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, our textbook affordability project is funded by academic affairs. So the library supports the work or is doing the work and the funding comes from academic affairs. And next slide. And like Heather said, we have tried to come at um, supporting faculty adoption and creation engagement in tiered, tiered approaches. So all of our professional development is tiered. And, you know, like Heather said that they kind of reached out to faculty, they did the syllabus uh, review to kind of see where faculty were. And we had kind of thought about, okay, do we do a survey? Like, how do we know where faculty are when it comes to just affordability and OER? Um, and at our institution, we, we just, have never quite had luck. We haven't found the way on how to do a good survey and get the data and get a lot of people to respond. So instead, I, I thought, why don't I just do tiered professional development and we allow faculty to come to the idea or the area that they feel the most comfortable. Um, and it really helped. It was really interesting to see with a uh, both attendance and registration rates, like where are our faculty interested in between these topics and how they engaged. So for just general professional development, this is not stipend. This is, these session, sessions are hosted through our Center for Teaching Excellence. Um, so they were a great partner. They allowed us to host this professional development series. And when we had faculty register, we let them know that all three sessions were going to happen so they could decide, you know, if they wanted to register to all three or just one or how, how they were going to do that. So the first level, we just did the basic OER 101. Um, and with that, we talked about just the basic definition of OER, uh, the benefits of adopting OER, how to find it. So I did like a live screen share of just the basic OpenStax, Open Textbook Library and OER text, because we are in Texas, but that could be replaced with OER Commons. Um, and then we just talked about the current campus initiatives because having an open education librarian was so new, we wanted to make sure that they knew there was the service existed and there was a person to support them one on one or as a department or at a college level, however, they need it. There was the support at the library and we wanted to make sure faculty knew that. Um, then we went with level 2, which was OER adoption. And there we just dug a little deeper, of course, defined OER again to make sure they understand these definitions. We talked about. Um, in adoption, I kind of went with the teaching side and talked about backwards design. So to kind of get their brains thinking about instead of, you know, having a textbook and then creating a course to fit that textbook, it's what are your outcomes? And now let's find resources that fit those outcomes. So like really building a course that fits with our students and our demographic and even that specific course and letting them know that OER gives them that capability. Um, we talked about evaluating, how do you compare it to traditional textbooks, as well as um, do ancillary materials exist? That's always, uh, at least at ETRGB with their high enrollment courses, it's a big topic. You know, these faculty are teaching gigantic classes and they want to know what support they may have when it comes to the extra materials. Um, and so we talked a little bit about that, as well as what does course marking look like in Texas? So just thinking about if they decide to adopt OER, these are some things you may want to consider. And then the last tier was talking about the true adaptation uh, and the remixing of OER as well as open pedagogy. So going back to those, because it's the center, we did it through the Center for Teaching Excellence, is pulling, making those bridges between OER and teaching. So we talked about flexibility um, that OER provides. We talked about copyright and open licensing. Um, Creative Commons, we talked about renewable assignments, what does that mean, um, open pedagogy and active learning. And what I tried to do in this session was let them know that all of these teaching strategies that are seen as excellence in teaching, that they can, by using OER, they can check like four or five of those boxes 
without having to do anything extra. Just the act of adopting and utilizing OER to the fullest, they're truly having, um, they're, they're, they're doing multiple teaching excellence practices just by that adoption. So letting them know OER isn't something extra. OER actually allows you to do all these things in one go. So that's kind of the, the tact that I took with that session. And it was really interesting, the attendance rates with that. So our highest uh, registration rate was to our OER 101. So the most faculty registered for that session. And then our lowest attended session was the OER adoption. And our highest attended session was the OER adoption and open pedagogy, which really surprised me because I didn't think our faculty were ready for that like tier three conversation because we were just beginning our OER journey. Um, so it really helped me realize maybe they don't know what OER is, but they are really interested in creating and, and, and open pedagogy. So I knew that was, I need to talk more about those things than I do just basic definitions. Um, so that was what I learned when it came to our tiered professional development. And then next slide, please. And then I'll talk quickly about um, our tiered professional development when it comes to stipends and grants. So we provide three options for our faculty. We have, uh, again, tiered like level one, level two, level three. And the level one Texas Learn OER is a set of online modules that were created by a Texas institution um, and then remixed by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And they are just online open modules that talks about the basics of OER and the OER landscape in Texas. And so for a $200 stipend, professional development stipend, these, I put faculty through this course. So it's just that basic, like, again, dipping your toes in the water. What is OER? What, do, what are these letters I keep hearing over and over again? And I support them through that process. And then the level two is the open textbook reviews. And some of you may have heard that through the open education network. So that's because we're a partner, we run those, uh, this professional development on our campus. And it's that same, like, okay, so now you kind of know what OER is. Maybe you've dug into a couple of repositories. Now, again, this is a $200 opportunity to kind of sit down and truly look at an OER in your field to see, to, to judge for yourself. Is this something you would like? Is this something of interest? Um, with both the level one and level two, these small professional development stipends, there's no requirement to adopt. It's just providing that information to them. And then our last level three is then our full text, uh, affordable textbook adoption grant process where uh, faculty are uh, provided a $1,500 stipend to truly adopt an OER or a library licensed material for their course. So they just they they decided, yes, this is what I want to do. I'm going to do it and take the time to do so. Um, and so again, the the professional the level one and level two professional development grants, our faculty adore them. We have run uh, three cohorts of them. So I've done three Texas Learn cohorts in three consecutive springs, and then I ran three cohorts of the open textbook reviews um, in the fall. So we always had faculty coming in and out of our program of learning about OER. And so for Texas Learn, we had 137 faculty um, register and 86 complete. And that's because I had to set a limit of like, we can only fund this many. So it wasn't just a truly open. So there would, that number would have been much higher if I had unlimited funds. And then our reviews, we had 89 faculty register and 61 complete. And then for our affordable textbook adoption grant, we have hosted it now for 11 cohorts, which is wild. I didn't realize it was that many. Um, and we've had 183 faculty apply and 42 complete, but we have 20 currently in the process of either teaching with the resource or uh, building their course right now. So. Um, just like the professional development uh, 
uh, series, you know, we make sure that faculty can engage in, in how they want. We're not forcing them through a process or they can, you know, come in to OER when they have time or when they feel that they're ready to take the next step. We provide those opportunities. My turn. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that, Gabby. I, I just love hearing about your programs. Like you have such so much going on and I feel like that tiered approach is just absolutely brilliant. So um, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, UT Austin has a slightly different approach. We have a library funded fellowship program, and this is specifically for adoption and creation of OER. And I'll talk more about the details, but faculty members do apply to either a fully, they fully flip their course from being reliant on paid materials to absolutely cost-free. So by the end of the fellowship, it has to be cost-free. This is a stipend supported program. So the uh, faculty members are given a monetary uh, award for using their time to do this. And let's talk about the details. So the Open Education Fellowship, um, as I mentioned before, faculty apply to either adopt or create open education resources for an existing course. Uh, we are actually in the middle of that application process at the moment. We send out a call. I send out a call at the beginning of October of this month, and then we kind of gather the applications in a review committee consisting of uh, students, if we can get a student, uh, the other librarians and faculty review those um, applications anonymously and then make decisions based off the um, what the fellows have put out. And the the sorry, the details that we look at, the criteria that we look at, is will they be adopting or creating? A lot of times we like to um, prioritize the creation because it doesn't exist already. And so that's, we want, really want that to share. Um, and how, how many students are gonna be affected? So some priority is given to those high enrollment courses. If you know if this faculty is gonna clip a course with 200 students, so it's entirely cost-free, that's a lot of ROI in the long run. So we look at that um, and we look at just the strength of the applicants. Uh, feelings for OER, uh, do they feel like they can get this done during the fellowship time? A lot of factors go into that, but it's not just one person making decision, it's, it's an entire review committee that's making those decisions. Um, and then the selected faculty, if they accept their position within the fellowship, are awarded stipends, and then they receive direct professional development through the library in order to complete their projects. I, I run this so it's basically, I am kind of their project manager throughout this entire thing. I'm checking in on them, making sure that they're hitting certain checkpoints. I'm making sure that they have the correct training that they need, whether it's technical assistance or it's assistance on accessibility in terms of how can I make my uh, OER textbook screen reader compatible? How can I um, make sure that I am inclusive to students? Those kind of, of questions, and um, it all comes through me. Uh, so a little bit of some history of the fellowship. It is a rather new fellowship. It was proposed directly to our vice provost and director in 2021. And so this went straight to our vice provost and she approved it um, pretty much immediately. And then we started the call for the fellows in 2022. The inaugural fellows completed their projects in the spring or fall of 2022, spring of 2023. Uh, and then we've had another round go through and we are currently in the application period for our third cohort of fellows. The program is still going strong um, and so we're on a third co cohort now. So fellowship requirements for those of uh, those uh, faculty who are wanting to complete this fellowship, they must replace an existing paid course with OER. And so it really does have to be fully flipped is what they have to commit to. If they're still going to require students to purchase paid materials, paid readings, paid programs, um, it is no, it's, it's, it doesn't qualify for this. Um, we've had some interesting situations kind of crop up, with, especially when it comes to uh, technical courses, coding, that stuff. Those are usually reviewed on a case by case basis. But in the interest of fairness, since these are the rules, like we really do uh, lean towards those courses that will be flipped. I, the, I don't, I can't think of a situation in which we've amended those rules to allow a faculty member who will not have a fully free course at the end of the fellowship to continue. Um, 
the course must be offered by UT. So this is this can't be a, a faculty member from another institution or another sister school. It has to be UT Austin faculty members for UT Austin students. And then their completed project must be OER. So this is not a stipend to assist faculty members in creating a textbook that will then be offered for sale. It must carry a Creative Commons license or equivalent. Uh, I think we have one fellow who's finishing up right now who has a, a license from MIT license for like coding, but it's still an open license. So as long as that resource at the end qualifies as an OER, it has a Creative Commons license or it can be shared otherwise, um, then they're good. And then the faculty must report their course as belonging to as being an OER course to our co-op. And that's just a way we have, um, and Gabby, you may feel the same, we have kind of a, a difficulty with getting faculty to report OER courses. Um, it makes it very difficult for us to count the OER courses. So this is just a way to try to help us uh, kind of bridge that gap and be like, oh, yes, this is an OER course right there. So support for our fellows during the fellowship. Uh, there are five total stipends that are awarded to fellow. So five faculty members or five teams of faculty members are selected for each cohort. Um, those faculty members, as I mentioned before, are supposed to either adopt or create OER. So the adoption stipend is $2,000 awarded in a single payment when the course is flipped. So at the end of the fellowship. And then the authorship stipend is $5,000 and it's awarded in halves. So throughout my check-in process of um, making sure that fellows are on track, once they get to about the halfway point, they get a $2,500 stipend award. And then when they finish the piece and it is the course is cost-free, then they get the other half. During the first cohort, we had um, about three adoptees. So three, uh, co three fellows who were adopting OER for their course and two fellows who were authoring OER for their course. We changed things a little bit with the cohort that is finishing things up now. Uh, we had a lot of strong authorship applications, and so we amended from five stipends to three. And so we have three groups right now, but they're all authorships. And so we have two fellows, one fellow who is doing kind of course modules with the MIT license that I mentioned, and then two fellows who are actually authoring full OER textbooks with uh, through library resources. Um, so it's going to be really great when they're done. Professional development for the fellows while they were working on their projects. Uh, really, uh, as I mentioned before, I run this program myself with the help of uh, the head of scholarly communications, of course, uh, but I am the main point of contact with myself and the head of scholarly communications. We offer guidance on the Creative Commons licensing because that can be really tricky for faculty to navigate. And so we definitely uh, offer guidance on that. We give accessibility training in terms of like screen reading, how to help uh, students with disabilities who may not be able to access those kinds of things. And that go that is not through me directly. That's through our Office of uh, Disability and Access. So they actually come in and do a training for these fellows to help give them ideas and help support if they have questions and that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, we do give limited technical support. One resource that we use is Pressbooks for our OER uh, cohorts, for our OER fellows, sorry. We use Pressbooks, and so I'm also the point of contact for Pressbooks. <laughs> so if they have technical questions about Pressbooks, I can help them with that on a limited basis. We can't offer a lot of technical support, like if someone wanted to build an entire new system or something for their coding course, I don't think we'd be able to help them with that. But some technical support we can offer either directly or through someone else on campus. And then, as I mentioned before, regular project check in meetings, troubleshooting for them, connecting them with the right person. All of that is typically on me uh, with the help of scholarly communications. I saw a question come into the chat about how long do they have? I'm actually not sure I included it in my slides. I don't know what, how did that slip my mind? It is um, three, currently it is three semesters. And so uh, three semesters to complete the project. So if we're looking at um, the, the cohort, like let's pretend that's how it is now. Um, right now we're in the application period. So that's that closes today, the application is closed today. We will have fellows selected by the middle of next month. Um, and then we, in December, we will extend an invitation and have initial meetings. Spring of next semester will be professional development, talking to them about what their projects are going to look like, helping them kind of figure out a timeline and a roadmap, getting them connected with offices of disability and access or whatever other uh, support they may need. And then 
um, the fall of next year, summer of next year of 2024 and fall of 2024 is independent work time. And so by the end of fall of 2024 in a um, perfect world, they will be completed with their projects. Now your second follow-up question may be, what if they're not? <laughs> and that is very common. And so we are not the uh, OER, OE fellows, like we, we try not to make it punitive. Like we want these uh, faculty members to complete their work. We want them to, to share OER with the world and share it with UT. So we're very flexible. Like the project check-in meetings are specifically for that, to for me to go in and say, okay, what's not working? How can I help you? How can we get this project over the finish line? Um, but we have had multiple either fellows individually or groups of fellows have to extend their time. And that's not a big deal. It just means that they don't get the, the last payout of the stipend until the project is complete. The only caveat to that is through our internal finance, we can only pay them if they are employed by ET Austin. So if they're an author fellow and they start the project and they make it halfway and they get the first payment um, and then they leave after that, we can't pay them to finish the project. So they do have to finish the fellowship while they're at UT. And we'll we'll circle back to faculty finishing because I, I do have a slide in there about that. So I can talk a little more about that, but I don't want to go over too long here. Let's see what I have. Um, and so the nuts and bolts of this fellowship, oh, I do have something about the deadline there, that's fine. It is uh, funded through internal library funds. That's gonna be money that is exists within the library already that is earmarked for OER and then fundraising efforts. Some of the money that we use are in endowments. And so we have payouts through endowments. Um, and then a lot of it came from the same uh, endowment that paid for my current position, the Talker Foundation. And so we take that out of that money, but we are looking for, um, the, as we all, I think everyone here in the room probably knows, funding is so unstable. <laughs> and so we are looking for a way to make permanent sustained funding for this program. It was, it's really not, um, it's not a tightrope. We're not worried about like the, the, the near future, but uh, we do need to nail things down so that it can continue in the, in the far future. Um, support, uh, on-demand librarian support, as I think I've talked about, perhaps ad nauseum, like it is me, I am there for them, I'm their project uh, manager, and then cross-departmental training, whether that's other liaison librarians coming in to help or uh, the disability, uh, the Office of Disability and Access, all of that. Um, we have whoever they need, sometimes IT will come in, or I mentioned Pressbooks. I have one fellow who's using Pressbooks and I'm kind of navigating talking with IT, talking with Pressbooks, talking with the fellow to try to get all of that worked out for them. And then the deadlines, as I mentioned before, um, I said two semesters, but it really it should be three. And we also are um, thinking of extending the, the deadlines for the fellows, because as we have learned, faculty get into semester mode and things get busy and things uh, get thrown at them that aren't usually their typical duties. And so um, they have had some issues. So we're talking about extending the program as well. So it's a work in progress for sure. Uh, some samples here. I don't want to take up too much time, but I did want to brag on this one. Um, you'll have uh, these slides and can explore on your own, but this is some uh, course that came out of our um, fellowship. This is an Italian textbook created by our fellows, and this lives in Pressbooks. And it looks just like a regular ebook. If you click on read book, the entire book lives here on Pressbooks. You have the contents um, with all of the chapters, and there's even interactive activities in here. So this is something that our fellows through the fellowship created and are being um, somewhat compensated for, not as a traditional public house, publishing house would, but they are being supported through our stipend in order to create this. So I thought it would be cool to kind of show you what this looks like. We're also working on an integration to integrate Canvas and um, Pressbooks so that every Canvas is our gradebook learning management system if you, if you don't have the same thing where you are. Um, and so the entire book would live on Canvas and could be graded out there as well, which is pretty cool. Okay. All right, so we'll talk briefly about um, outreach methods next. How have we gotten the word out about our uh, respective programs and try to draw faculty in? We at UT Austin have partnered with liaison librarians, internal newsletters, social media, and then targeted outreach to past fellows. In the future, I think we're going to extend that to targeted outreach toward to faculty members who are either in high enrollment classes or faculty members who we feel might be a good fit for our program as well. So it really is kind of like 
reliant on other librarians and other departments to help us spread the word. And our outreach is fairly similar, uh, but one thing I have noticed that really, really works for our faculty is receiving an email from someone they know. So our most, all of our professional, so the professional development series that goes out from the email list for our Center for Teaching Excellence. A lot of faculty engage in that program. They already have an audience base. The library does not have that audience. So, so by creating them and hosting them through the library, we don't have the type of outreach that our Center for Teaching Excellence does. So our attendance rates are significantly higher when we partner with them, as well as when we put out the call for applications instead of the call for applications for both our mini stipends and our affordable textbook adoption grant. We promote it through the library, but it's also promoted through the Office of Faculty Success and Diversity. And then faculty see that heading and they go, oh, this is something big. Let me apply. And so we have seen our attendance and our applications rate significantly jump when they come out from one of these two places. Okay, and then um, lessons learned. Sorry, Gabby, I couldn't remember if you had your own slide. No, okay, so this is good. This is both of us together. Perfect. So lessons learned, like, as I mentioned before, and I know Gabby knows, like, these programs are extremely beneficial, but they're also, like, growth mindset when we approach these. And so what have we learned um, from our respective programs and, and, and what we need to do in the future? Uh, as I mentioned slightly before, it is difficult to, difficult to support faculty in completing a project on deadline, especially when they are uh, swamped with a hundred other thousand things. I do not have a clear answer for this uh, right now because we're currently navigating several situations in which we are going to have faculty who aren't complete yet. But one thing I would stress that I have learned is to not come at it from a punitive standpoint um, and to be as flexible as possible and as supportive as possible. Um, but I would if you are thinking of considering a program like this on your own campus, I would stress the importance of thinking about this and how you want to approach it before it happens, because if you do the opposite and it happens and you're not quite sure how to navigate it, it can be stressful for all parties involved. So just think about uh, deadlines and how you want to approach that. I mentioned a little bit about continued funding. Um, we are looking for avenues to make sure that that funding stays permanent. Um, and then I think the rest might be yours, Gabby. Yeah, and just to sum mine up, so we have a few minutes for questions, is just um, try not to do this work on your own. It truly takes a campus-wide effort. Um, if you can build a community of practitioners, maybe I, we're very lucky. We have a very big system, and so we have others that we can reach out to, but maybe there's other local colleges or universities that you know to build that support so you can ask these types of questions. Um, and just providing, for us, providing opportunities for faculty engaged at various levels on their time and the level that they that they choose has really helped our program. So I know I can speak, I think for both of us, if you have any questions or would like to know more about our programs or wanna build that community, um, please feel free to reach out to either of us. We're always happy to talk about our programs and some of the things we do. Thank you both so much. This is great information and great lessons learned and really key tangibles for everyone here. I know there's a question from Ellen about funding. Um, were internal library funds reallocated from something else or were these new funds specifically for OER? I think this is for the UT Austin one. I'm um, just curious if there was a shift in priorities or there was just something newly that was added on. Um, I can't, I, I don't. I don't know much about money. Um, I, should maybe, I should maybe know more, uh, but I do know that the funds that funded my position, the Talker Foundation, was a, um, a an individual who gave this money to the library specifically to fund my position, and we're also using that funds for this. But we also do have some funds and other endowments that have been earmarked for OER. They, those are not endowments that were specifically for OER. So I think it helps a lot that we have a provost and director who very much prioritizes OER and wants OER to uh, continue at UT Austin. And so we're being helped a lot by that. But what really got this going was the endowment by an individual specifically for OER. Great. I think we have time for one more question. I don't see any new ones yet from the chat, though. Any questions, folks? Oh, 
Okay. Well, thank you both so much. This was incredibly helpful. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming.